This episode brought to you by Max Belts. Guys, are you looking for a perfect accessory to wear every single day for every single scenario? Well, you've come to the right place. We all know that nothing stands up to wear and tear like a good leather belt. If you're looking for the toughest leather belt on earth, then you've come to the right place. Max Belts. They're handcrafted in the USA by veterans who are serious about their craft. And if you're looking for a belt that's tough enough for your active lifestyle and help support those who've given so much to our country, look no further than Max Belts. It's the toughest belt on the planet. It's a perfect solution for casual or dress wear and ideal for utility and firearm carry. It's the highest caliber of American craftsmanship, and it also positively impacts our military charity partners. Once again, Max Belts, you can't go wrong with them. I wear them every day. They're the toughest belt on earth. And you can find all of this and so much more at maxbelts.com. Three, two, one, and we're live. Hey guys, welcome back to the DTD podcast, Dynamic Tales Delivered. Once again, I'm still out here with my friends at the JFK Special Warfare Center, learning a lot and getting a peek behind the curtain of what it takes to be a Green Beret, what it takes to be in the Army these days, and kind of the political environment that we're in and the world environment that we're in. This morning and this week, we have Lieutenant Colonel Ben Bringhurst. You are the director of the Language School. Yes, sir. Um, And it's really interesting to me that because when I was talking to Bobby about talking to you I thought that the language school was always in Monterey and he said the important thing about you guys was you had the second largest language school in all of DOD uh, except for Monterey Um, that's correct so let's talk a little bit about that tell me a little bit about the school how it kind of came to be what you guys train over there, and then we're going to talk about the importance of language. Absolutely. So uh, I guess to get into that, we got to start at the beginning. That's right. We got to go back. The the roots of special operations, you know, coming out of World War II, and obviously we have the legacy there of the Jedburgh teams that jumped into France uh, with French speakers, native French speakers, and worked with those French partisans against the, you know, the, the Nazi threat there. Uh, and from that, as we we moved into the Cold War era, um, the U.S. saw the need for language-capable special operations forces to build relationships in countries all over the world in that, that era to fight the communist threat. Um, and so from that, the language requirement was established, and we've been training language ever since for the same purpose. Um, so as you mentioned, the school in, in uh, Monterey, California, the Defense Language Institute, uh, they train a lot of cryptologic linguists, so intel-focused, threat-focused folks. Uh, and to counterpoint that, our school here, which trains about a thousand soldiers a year, um, we train for conversational fluency to build relationships with our partner nations uh, and with partner nations, special operations forces across the world. Uh, so we've got about 200 language professionals from all over the world on staff here um, who are training our soldiers each and every day in 13 different languages right now. And we're looking to add a couple more that change based on requirements from U.S. Army Special Operations Command. Um, so at any given time, we got four or 500 students here um, at the schoolhouse learning those 13 different languages, preparing to go out into the world and engage on behalf of the United States government. So let me ask you, how important is language? You talked about when they jumped in, they had French speakers with them. So I'm sure there was some communication breakdown. As we all know, there's communication breakdown a lot when things hit the fan. So how important is it that these guys learn this? Because it's conversational. It's trying to train someone to do the job that you guys do so that we don't necessarily have to put boots on the ground. We can have people ahead of us already planning that mission out. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And it's critical in my mind. Um, and and we, we talk about the language piece and language is an essential part of what we do, but we also train culture and cultural fluency, um, both area specific and then in general, the realization of other cultures and the ability to operate therein. Um, as you know, as a, a native native born American, right? Um, and and m- many of our soldiers don't have that experience when they come through our doors, so they get that first look at interacting with someone from a different culture in a different language, learning to think the way they think, right? Learning to see the world through their eyes to some degree. And I look at it this way: we train our special operators in a lot of special skills, in all the shoot, move, and communicate, all the things you'd think of when you think of a special operator. But the lubricant that allows them to get into different countries and do their job effectively, and as you pointed out to get someone else to do their job effectively 
is that language and cultural fluency. So it's absolutely critical to the soft mission. And I think that's an important part that a lot of people don't know. And I got to tell you, I didn't know when I came down here was that you teach the cultural aspect of it. And that's the coolest part of it to me, because when you talk about uh, people that are either in school or in college or whatever, and they got to take a foreign language, no one wants to do it because it's going over the basics. Where's the library? Where's the bathroom? All that kind of stuff. You guys are teaching on a different level. But to go up a step past that, you're teaching the cultural significance of everything. And I think that's an important thing that a lot of people don't understand about how a language is learned. And by putting cultural significance on it, teaching the, the, not only the language, but where spices come from. I heard that you teach where spices come from, where foods come from, what areas that those are specialized in. Can we talk a little bit about the cultural influence and how you guys train that into your soldiers? Absolutely. So there's two different levels that we train culture in, and two different ways we look at it. So we call it, you know, internally, we call it strategic culture and tactical culture, right? Just to, to put it in, mil in military terms, um, that strategic culture is kind of the big picture. How does culture play into the way governance is in a, in a given country? Um, how does it play into the conflicts that are going in the region? Those sorts of things. And we train that with PhD level instructors who come in and they'll teach uh, based off of their expertise. But that tactical level culture is almost more important for our operators. And what we'll do is all throughout the course, we have tactical level cultural engagements built in, in language, in target language, where they will have to engage with a foreign dignitary, where they will have to go to someone's house. You know, maybe their partner has invited them to their house and they have to interact appropriately with individuals of different age ranges, different cultural statuses, et cetera. And so they learn to actually operate within that culture, not just speak the language. And as you pointed out, those are two separate things, right? Two separate skills. And so we integrate them together as they go through the course. And by the time they finish, they can feel comfortable going into that first engagement with a partner in that target language and in that target culture as well. And we're talking about guys that are, you know, in their 20s, but most generally they're in their 20s. Maybe they have never taken a language before, a foreign language. They've only spoken English. And, you know, sometimes as much as we say it, they may have regional dialect. They may have a certain way of speaking that they have to change that so the biggest thing that i want to know is when they come in and you have these guys that have never spoken another language where do you see the biggest breakdown and where do you see the biggest aha moments for them where they get it absolutely so we do see those challenges of individuals coming in without an understanding of culture period right there's individual language struggles language is hard right for everybody especially if you've never studied we work through that we've got great professionals on the team um, who can help them work through any any learning issues that they're having. But the biggest problem we see is folks coming in who have not learned to see the world from any view but their own. And that's our biggest challenge and our biggest breakthrough is seeing those folks. You know, some of them come from, you know, small towns in the South or, you know, all across the U.S., never been exposed to any culture but their own. And they come in here and their their view is expanded. They start to see the world not from a homogenous perspective, but from, you know, a multicultural perspective and realize that when I go to another country, they'll look at problems differently. They'll solve problems differently. Their value system's completely different, perhaps, than my own. Not right, not wrong, simply different, and I need to learn to operate within that and, and execute my mission still. And that's, that's the most rewarding thing, probably, for me, is to see those young soldiers come in and really have their worldview expanded, which will allow them to be effective special operators. Now, where do you see it break down, though, out in the field? And, and let me explain what I'm trying to say about that. So the last 20 years, sustained combat, we've been in countries all over the world. You get a different view. You may go in idealistic. You may go in with this idea that we're here to, to free the oppressed, to do all of those kind of things. And your worldview can't help but change. And I've talked about it in, in my current career. Your worldview changes. It's just unavoidable. When they've learned that language, when they've learned that culture, and they've learned to appreciate it, but then they see it put into action, there can be some disillusionment there. How do we get around that? Absolutely. Um, yeah, that's a tough question, and, and it's it's almost an individual question, right? Because if you've been on a soft mission to anywhere in the world, you've been on one soft mission, right? Each one's different. It's unique. It presents unique challenges. Um, I can speak from my experience. I was a, a 10th Special Forces Group operator. Um, so I operated in and around Europe, you know, around that that Russian rim kind of Eastern Europe. Um, 
And unfortunately, well, I say unfortunately, I learned Arabic in the course, modern standard Arabic. So I didn't get a, much of a chance to use it for about the first 10 years of my career. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Talking about solution that we Right. Made. Yeah. Um, so I had that for different reasons. But um, then I was given the opportunity because of my language ability, because of the level of language that I had attained, which wasn't all that high, but high enough, right, um, to go be the special operations liaison officer in Saudi Arabia, right? My first time in the Middle East, because I've been a Europe guy. Um, so I got to go over there and actually see, uh, uh, you know, a, a very, uh, almost the root Arabic culture there, right? As they see themselves as kind of the gatekeeper of uh, Islam, et cetera. Um, and it was fascinating to see how my view of what a true, you know, Arabic cultural experience is collided with that reality in Saudi Arabia. Um, and I'll, I'll give you one example, you know, I was working, you know, as the special operations liaison, I'm U.S. SOCOM's representative to the kingdom, to all of their soft forces. Um, and I was working to bring them together from across the army, navy, you know, their SEAL equivalents. The Good luck with that. Forces, absolutely yeah. right. We can barely do it here. So, um, but no, so, so I'm trying to do this and there was all kinds of institutional resistance to this. And I realized that it's because they're all coup proofing themselves. And so n the, the, the monarchy in this case doesn't want to let any one organization become too powerful. And it was baked into their culture from the days of, you know, nomads riding camels across the desert to take territory that no one power under their command becomes too powerful. And so I ran into this cultural like roadblock um, and had to reshape my view of what reality was in order to be successful in my mission. And eventually did that. It took me a little while, but, 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 but what I learned here allowed me to do that and the language that I had acquired. So let's go a little deeper into that. Let's talk about how you approach that problem, what you learned at the schoolhouse, what you learned in your special forces career before that, because like you said, eight years you were in Europe. How did you, because we want to talk about thinking outside the box, using that training, how did you approach that situation and how did you fix it? Yeah, uh, it, the, the skills we teach are universal. And obviously, we teach a language based on a, a specific region of the world in which they're going to be employed, these special operators. But the skills we teach, especially the cultural skills, are universal. And so we teach our soldiers, and I learned to observe a situation, a cultural situation, not from my perspective, but try to see it from theirs. It's almost a form of empathy, right, in a, in a relationship where I'm not looking at it from my perspective. I'm trying to see your perspective, and that allows for understanding. And so that skill was what I had to apply, right? We trained that here in the course by throwing them into uncomfortable, you know, uh, very different situations from what they're used to, these students. Um, and they have to look at it through a cultural lens. They have to look at it from the perspective of their partner and say, why is he doing this thing that I don't understand? And then through, through engagement and through their own deduction, figure out what the reasons are behind that. And, and then devise a solution based on the actual problem, not the perceived problem. So those are the skills we teach to our soldiers here to operate within that cultural context and find solutions that are culturally appropriate. And that's what I had to apply there in Saudi finally and, and get to success. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm guessing you resolve the situation. When you resolve the situation, do you look back on your training and go, man, that really helped out here or that really helped out here? Or, or do you go take it another approach and go, yeah, I think I got this now. Oh no, <laughs> we've, we've never got this right. <laughs> and I'll revert back to, you know, when you, when you've solved a problem, you've solved the one problem, right? There are so many wicked problems out there to solve. <laughs> right. Um, but it does give you a little confidence that in the process and in those skills, um, as you mentioned, and we, I do look back, I do look back now on my Robin Sage experience, right? I do look back on my language school experience and some of the situations to which I was exposed that I thought were a little ridiculous back then. And now I say, hey, now I've seen that in real life. That's real. You know, it happened and I was prepared for it back in that SWIC schoolhouse. Um, yeah, and I'm grateful for those who, who helped me. And I'm, you know, right now as the director of that language and culture school, I'm just trying to recreate that and maybe make it a little bit better because I know that the world's almost a more complicated place than the world I went into, you know, 12 years ago when I graduated the course. Um, so we're trying to prepare these folks, um, in every respect to go out into this complex world and have success and be able to, to further us interests. And let's talk about something that I think is interesting between you and between your non-commissioned officers, because you're seeing it at a 30,000 foot level, you're putting all that together and making those forces join together. But you have your non-commissioned officers that are on the ground in the quote unquote trenches every day with these people living that culture, uh, trying to be a part of that team and trying to make those people a part of their team. 
Can we talk about the differences in an officer and a non-commissioned officer and their linguistic skills and their cultural skills putting to work out in an active zone? Absolutely. And I have huge amounts of respect for our non-commissioned officers in the soft community because as you, as you say right there, that, that's where the metal meets uh, right there is, is with the non-commissioned officers. They're engaging with the partners every day. And they're the ones largely on whom it is, um, the burden is placed to build that close relationship with those soldiers. Um, and they do a phenomenal job. Um, I have been impressed, absolutely impressed with the young, especially the really young non-commissioned officers that come through our schoolhouse doors. Um, they're intelligent, they're switched on, they have a thirst for learning and that ability and desire to go out into the world and do the special operations mission in a mature fashion. Um, and so as they go out there, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm planning with my officer counterpart on, on mission, right? They're, you know, down, maybe telling jokes. They're um, going to karaoke. They're doing the thing, the small things, I say small in quotes, right? The small things that matter the most when building a relationship. And so oftentimes they'll come and tell me things about the mission, about, you know, intel that they have gathered simply through their interactions with you know, with, with their counterparts on the ground. And it's just amazing the, um, you know, the level of relationship that they can build with those, those uh, language and cultural abilities that they have. It adds kind of an interesting factor into it, though, because when you go into these active zones or you go into these missions, you worry about your brothers that are all around you. But then you gain a whole new family by bringing this cultural experience to them, by living with them, by being immersed into the culture. Can we talk about how that affects kind of the psyche of now you not only have this very close family, but you also have this extended family that now you're concerned about them too? Absolutely. And that's the objective, right? That's the goal. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a difference, right, between building that extended family and going native. We always remember, hey, we work for this flag on the shoulder and that, that's where, where our loyalties lie. But as you build those relationships, it's natural um, that you develop that that care for those that you work with. And, uh, you know, I, I work extensively with Estonia and Sof, and I love those guys like brothers, right? Um, and uh, and I, I feel that sense of kinship, that they're, they're, they're kindred spirits in the, the Sof mission um, and, and similar in their mindset and the way they go about things. And uh, I, I would be worried if it wasn't that way. Right. And I've seen it across across all missions in Afghanistan as well. You gain almost a, um, a, a sense of uh, stewardship over those that you're working with and training and feel that sense of responsibility for them as they often feel for you as well. And so that just means that it's working, right? That, that relationship building, that rapport building, that ability to accomplish a mission by, with, and through your partner force that we're shooting for, it's working. And I've seen it on every, every uh, mission I've gone on, largely thanks to those non-commissioned officers you're talking about, right? Right. And, and if we even go a little deeper into that, when we think about uh, Afghanistan, when, when that finally how many people were trying to help get their interpreters out, were trying to help get people out that had helped them along with their mission, that that went so deep that they were back here completely removed from that situation, and there were people that went into action to try and help those people that had helped them over there, which is it, it speaks volumes for what's going on in, and the relationships that are built. Same. Let's break down the school a little bit, and let's talk about the languages that you speak, and then I want to get on after that and talk about what do you think are the most important ones right now and what do you think are the most important ones in the future because as we know it's a changing landscape every single day this episode is brought to you by trident coffee the veteran-owned brand where every sip inspires you to live life full steam ahead at trident they are more than just coffee they are storytellers it's crafted by veterans their instant cold brew is perfect for those who serve those who have served and anyone who values wellness Featuring natural ingredients like organic mushrooms, adaptogens, and nootropics, it's more than just a morning pick-me-up. It's your new wellness ritual. Enjoy it at home or on the go, wherever your day takes you. Trident Coffee isn't just about great-tasting coffee. It's about empowering you to be the healthiest version of yourself because great veterans make great citizens. Try their instant cold brew coffee today and taste the freedom of wellness. Remember, when you choose Trident, you're not just choosing coffee. You're choosing a path of connection through health and wellness. Use promo code DTD15 for 15% off your order. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, so the, make, the school right now, we teach a, a languages from all five of the major combatant command areas, right? 
Um, so Spanish always be important. All the South com speak Spanish with some Portuguese in there as well. Um, and then our Middle Eastern languages will always remain to be important. So uh, we, we teach three dialects of Arabic, Egyptian, Arabic, Levantine, and then modern standard is kind of the baseline. Um, and so we can engage all across the, you know, the Arabic speaking world with those dialects. Uh, additionally, we speak Persian. Farsi is more of a threat focused language uh, for, the, for the Iranian population and, and others um, who, who engage in Farsi. Um, and, and I think probably right now our focus is on a couple of things, right? Ukrainian is a, our newest program, newest language program for obvious reasons. Um, so we, we built that um, uh, and, uh, and just executed the first pilot successfully. And now we've got a couple classes in, and, and a couple more beginning. Um, and so that's a huge focus for us right now, working and engaging with those Ukrainian partners as they're in an active ongoing war. Um, and then in the Pacific, we have several priority languages. Japanese is one that we're starting to develop a curriculum for as we build our our relationship with the Japanese military um, in the Indo-Pacific, countering the kind of the, the, the growth of Chinese influence there. Um, so between that and, and uh, the Mandarin Chinese program for engagement with the Taiwanese population, those are probably the priorities right now. Um, I don't want to speak for U.S. Army Special Operations Command, and that can change tomorrow with the world as it changes. But you heard it here first. <laughs> That's right. But I, I'd say strategically, and again, I'll reiterate, we focus on relationship, language for relationships. And so the languages of our allies is the most important to us as opposed to the language of our threats. Right. Right. Well, the first question, how mad are you that now Ukrainian is a focus and you spent all those years? <laughs> yeah, I would love to learn Ukrainian. Absolutely. Came, came about, about a decade too late for me, but uh, no, it's fantastic to see. And like I said, we just sent our first batch of Ukrainian speakers out to Europe, to the European theater, and we're waiting eagerly to hear back the results of that. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm confident that they will have you know, a huge effect on the battlefield and, and in increasing the, the strength of that relationship. Now let's switch focus over to what you're talking about sure. in the Indo-Pacific. You're talking about uh, Japanese teaching that because of a Chinese threat, Taiwan, Taiwan, all of those kind of things. How important is it that we get this built up? Because we're not behind the power curve, but we're definitely just building that program up. So how much are we trying to make up in difference to get us on the ground being able to move at full speed? Yeah, so we're trying to anticipate the you know the rise of these requirements, and we've been engaging with the Japanese military in various capacities for you know for a long time, um, but we're looking to ramp up that engagement as they ramp up their military capability in response to to the perceived threat in the Pacific. Uh, it, it's hugely important to do it as quickly as possible, and we have a very responsive language program here uh, compared to most language programs across DoD. And I just talked; I was just at Defense Language Institute for a conference. They said for them, it's a two to three year process to develop a language before they can even run a pilot. And for us, it's about a six to eight month process wow. to build a curriculum before we can run that first pilot. So we're moving at the speed of soft, still slower than we'd like, but we're constrained by the realities of language. But we, we can get a, a language capability out there almost um, you know within about a year from That's incredible. US, uh, U.S. Army Special Operations Command saying go. So. so other than the standard can answer of moving at the speed of soft, Let's go into it a little deeper. What makes it so you guys can do that? Because that is absolutely incredible that within a year, you can already have a program stand up and ready to go and put people out on the ground. So let's talk about that. What makes it so that you guys can do that? At all. At, at risk of speaking for the, the Special Warfare Center and of course. Um, but, but as a soft training institution, we build our, our, our whole organization on the premise of quick flexibility, right? We understand the changing nature of the world and the rapidly changing nature of the world. And soft, part of the soft value proposition is our ability to flex to threats quickly, right? Provide um, capability quickly to meet uh, emerging threats. A and our schoolhouse is built on the same principles. And so our whole organization here is built with flexibility in mind. So I have a very flexible contract under which I can immediately hire language professionals um, and provide them simple guidance as far as, hey, here's what the, the framework of a curriculum looks like, and get them almost immediately working on that curriculum, um, and then guide them through the entire process. And then we uh, move forward with the pilots um, at, concurrently with our approval process, pushing the curriculum up through uh, SWIC and TRADOC for official approval. So we can actually start running courses and providing real operational capability to the force 
concurrently with the approval process for that POI. So all of that speeds up the process considerably from the, the kind of normal, you know, I'd say regular army process, but the DOD, you know, the speed of DOD process, which is right. sometimes a little slower than we would like. Well, I would like to point out something, though. When you say you can hire these people, bring them in to build a curriculum to do all this, um, you can't just bring anybody in. It, that's not a quick process either because they have to meet clearance and all of that kind of stuff. What kind of pool do you look at to bring those people in? Right. So we, we look heavily at the DL, DLI pool. They're already vetted. They've already been through uh, some level of background check. So that's our first look generally. And we'll, we'll often reach back to the Defense Language Institute for assistance with this and ask for you know available personnel. So that's our number one look. And it, it, if they don't have the personnel to fill it, it does take a little bit longer because we have to run the, the requisite background checks ourselves. Um, but it doesn't slow down the process too much um, since we're not working with classified material here. It's a simple language curriculum. We don't have to go in, into as much um, detail in those background checks as you would if you were hiring a, you know, a, an interpreter for classified, you know, classified items or, or something like that. So, so it does speed up the process and allows us a little more flexibility in our pool. Now, we're still careful. We still do occasionally have, have issues and, and have to let folks go, as you would imagine. Um, but, uh, but overall we've had great experiences with the folks we've hired and they, they, uh, generally love, love the U S and the, you know, the principles that we're trying to, um, to, to bring in and, and, uh, and champion across the world. So. Is there any possibility of learning more than one language being fluent in a couple different languages or, or conversational in a, in a couple different languages? Absolutely. And uh, the, the best example of that is probably our folks who, during the, the height of the global war on terror, were learning Pashto, we're learning Urdu, we're learning Dari, we're learning the languages spoken across Afghanistan, because that's where our, our major operations were. Um, now that that has ramped way back, um, many of those folks are now relanguaging. And so they'll come back through a, a language course, four to six months, and learn a new applicable language to their AOR. So we've got uh, quite a few folks doing that right now. Um, we'll also do that with emerging requirements. So um, at need, we can retrain folks who already have a, a primary language in a second language as well, and they end up conversationally fluent in both. So yeah, it happens uh, with, with uh, some, some degree of frequency across the soft force. We also have quite a few heritage speakers who will come in, and, and sometimes we'll, we'll then teach them a second language. And so they're more flexible. More, more utility for the force, the soft force, and can be used in more situations. So let's talk about Afghanistan for just a second, because you said that they were learning all these different languages. How important was that in those village stabilization uh, operations that were going on? How important was that language and to learn those each individual dialect? Yeah, especially in the VSO or village stability ops um, or any operation where you're counting on your partner for security which was the, you know, the situation there. They lived in those villages. They worked in those villages and counted on those villages for their, their early warning, their security, et cetera. Um, it's absolutely critical that you speak some, that, that, that language to some degree um, for your own security and safety, but also for the ability to build that relationship that allows for your, your, your security and safety in a, in a much broader sense. Um, so I, I, I would say it was absolutely crucial. And, and those who had learned the language well and could operate within that language had great success in Afghanistan. We saw it in a couple of different areas. Um, the VSO operation was largely successful based on, based on those language and cultural skills. Well, and that, that was a question that I wanted to ask you was when they learn that language and they're learning it quickly to put it into use over there. And it's, as we've said numerous times, it's a evolving system, um, but they learn a language where it's not patronizing, it's solidifying their relationship with them. Uh, and I think that's a major important role, too, that they don't think, oh, these guys are just trying to speak to me. They're really trying to learn what's going on. And you see a difference in how they take care of those troops than, than ones that would just come in, not know, and, and, and not really understand what was going on. Now, how do you break down... By teaching culturally, it could get very, very uh, into minutia over there of learning each tribe, each individual village, each individual province, all that kind of stuff. How do you break it down to let give people the best uh, opportunity when they get into theater? 
Sure. And, and, and again, we, we teach cultural principles and the, the principles of operating within a culture. We teach curiosity, right? We teach an open mind. We teach critical thinking skills when you see something or an interaction that you don't understand. And so when they go in, if they don't necessarily have the expertise in that particular of course. Vibe or that, you know, which they won't, we can't teach all that, um, not in the time frame that we have, um, but they are trained in how to observe, how to be curious, how to try new things, how to experiment, how to, you know, evaluate those results and then re-evaluate their picture of how they, how they view those cultural interactions. And uh, armed with those tools, where we feel confident sending SOF anywhere in the world, whether they know that specific culture or not, with the confidence that they'll be able to adapt and learn to swim in those waters. Um, and and we, we've, we've seen great success. I'll, I'll give you a, a great example. I had a, I'll leave his name out of it because okay. it's still operational. Um, but I, I had a fantastic, he was an echo. So he was a communication sergeant on my team when I deployed to Afghanistan. Now, his language was, um, was French because we were a European-based team, but in Afghanistan, he would go out to our partners, and because of his personality, he was, a, he was a loud Bostonian, right? And they all loved him. They loved him. And so he used that ability to build rapport and relationships and an understanding of how their cultural interactions worked to get so deeply embedded into that unit that he could have asked them to do anything, and they would have done it because they loved him. Um, and he didn't speak a lick of the language. So sometimes, you know, language is hugely important. Don't get me wrong. But that ability to operate within a culture and that ability to to operate within their cultural understanding can often be more important to the success of the mission. How important is character and what I mean by character, how important is, as you've talked about, that that thirst for knowledge, that that they want to know what's going on? How important is that at the school to getting through it? Because I have to go back once again and say there's got to be people that struggle uh, understanding that, but what is it inside or what is that special thing that can kind of keep them pushing in the right direction to have that thirst to go, man, I'm really not getting this, but I really want to get this. Sure. Um, I think that's part of what we assess for in the selections, um, the, the RSOS selections. One of the things they're looking for is that thirst to improve that thirst to, um, to learn new things and experience new things and a humility that allows that to happen. And I think that's probably the most important attribute is a humility, um, to place yourself in an uncomfortable situation. That's going to make you look foolish because you don't know how to react, learn from that and move forward. And so that's the biggest thing I'd say we're looking for in, in soft operators period. And the biggest thing we're trying to train them in, um, or improve is that humility in a cultural context, right? that ability to understand that my way is not their way and that I need to learn their way because I'm trying to work within their construct, um, wherever country, whatever, whatever system I'm working in, right. Um, to the extent of my obviously U S ethics and morals. Um, and there are some boundaries that, that obviously we will not cross, but, but, uh, to the extent that we can, we teach that humility and curiosity, um, and, and assess for it. So oftentimes the folks we get are the right folks, right? And occasionally we have a few who are struggling with that, that concept of strong in other areas and we work with them to build that um, or those capabilities and those attributes while they're here in the course. Well, and I'm glad you brought that up because that was the next question that I was going to ask you was, yes, they have to learn that culture and it is their world that they're living in, but there comes a point in time where they have to bring those American values and win the quote unquote hearts and minds and let them know, this is why we're here. This is why we're doing this. And you should want to be a part of this. How do they do that? Yes, sir. And then, there's a couple different ways they do that. And it's, that's part of the art of special operations is, uh, it's almost, almost a salesmanship game, right? And it, it helps when you have a good product to sell, which we do, right? Um, and, and most nations across the world recognize that the values that the U S brings are good values are things that are desirable. Um, and, and partnership with the U S is a very positive thing as, as compared to partnership with some of our major adversaries, which comes with many, many strings attached. Um, so it's, it's often not a difficult sell down at the, the micro level, down at the human level. It's sometimes a little, a little more challenging, um, as we, we bump up into, um, you know, differences in how prisoners are treated and those, those sorts of things as we saw across 20 years of the war on terror, um, and differences in how some ethical decisions are approached in cultures that are heavy into bribery and things like that. Um, and, and that's when it's incumbent upon the, generally it falls upon the team leadership at that point to, to make an ethical and moral stand, describe, Hey, these are the values of the United States. And this is the relatively small price that is paid for, 
U.S. military assistance and U.S. partnership um, is adherence to these ethical principles. Um, and generally, we have success with that. And it's it's always a challenge, right? Um, but our, our our folks have that strong moral compass, and I've seen it more and more as as folks come through the course. Um, they're, they're coming with an inherent moral compass, and they're ready for those challenges as they go into the world. How important is it for the leadership to be bought in on this? Uh, and I'm not just talking at the schoolhouse. I'm talking about in the language and learning the cultures in presenting that idea to the people that work for them in these areas of operation. Yeah, it's critical, right? Um, and we've seen as folks go out into the force and over the last 20 years, language ability in the force suffered a little bit because there was constant deployments. And uh, when we weren't deployed, we were training to deploy. And when you're looking at your, you know, your, your slate of training and the days you have to train, there's never enough days and always too much training. Um, and generally, those things that involve survivability more directly, right? Your, your shoot, move, communicate, medicate, um, those things took precedence. And so as we're coming out of that, we're seeing an increased command influence on language, increased recognition of language as a force multiplier, um, as a critical tool to accomplish the mission and as an, a, a security measure. Um, all of those things are coming back. But but yeah, it's absolutely critical that there is command understanding and command emphasis on language as a critical piece in the soft kit. And we're starting to see that change uh, across the force as we come out of the war on terror and that mindset um, that was necessary. Don't get me wrong. I'm not bashing any commanders who did that. Um, but we're in a different world now, and language is coming more to the forefront as an important piece of our uh, our image. And I think it's important to point out that not just in the soft community, language for big army or the the major units that are moving into there is a very important thing. And I think when you have partnership between big army and soft units, it's very important that that crossover happens where they show them, hey, we're here doing a job, but this is why we're doing that job. And I think that you guys lead the way on that. Yeah, I'd like to think so as well. And I think we do. And uh, that's one of the, the major roles that, that SOF has taken upon itself is as connective tissue. And we do it between, you know, big army and, and three-letter agencies within our own government. But we also have a hugely important role between, you know, our, our counterparts in the conventional force and our partner forces across the world. And we saw, I saw that all across Europe. When I was there, we were conducting the Operation Atlantic Resolve. Um, it was probably, you know, five, six years ago now. Uh, but there were conventional units staged uh, through the Baltics. So Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland. There were tank units. There were infantry units, right? There were aviation units there. Um, they were often a bit removed from the, the local population, right? Um, didn't have quite that same cult ability to integrate culturally. Right. And so we'd often take them out. We'd often help them to, to kind of lubricate that, that relationship a little bit um, and allow for better integration and better partnership and teamwork. And I'm sure that's happening across the world because that's what special operations do. That's what operators do almost inherently. It's almost built into us um, that we want to see those relationships grow. We understand the importance of them. And so we assist that wherever we can. So let's talk about the future for the last kind of to wrap this up. Let's talk about the future of the language school, what you guys are planning on doing, improving, because we can always be improving, what you guys are planning on improving, what you plan on Im changes that you're implementing, and then what's kind of the future for you once you're done with the language school. Absolutely. So we got a couple initiatives going right now. Um, so we're, we're taking a kind of a tour of academia to the, the major language training centers across universities in the United States and in the military system. So the Air Force Academy, West Point, that have fairly robust language and culture programs. Uh, we're looking to pick their, their best practices out from an academic perspective. So I know they're moving heavily into the AI sphere, using AI as a learning tool, as a conversational partner, and an always ready tutor that can provide feedback on language and culture. Um, which is pretty amazing. We're working through some of the uh, the implications of that that the whole U.S. government's working through with, hey, which AI can you use and to what extent, that sort of thing. But we're looking heavily into that as a tool for our for our language learners. And then we also are, are uh, standardizing our cultural program, our tactical cultural program, as mentioned. Um, so we're providing uh, you know a standard kind of set of scenarios for our students to go through that'll culminate in a one or two day culminating exercise at the end of the course where they will have to use their language and the cultural knowledge and and problem solving skills that we've given them to navigate in a bunch of very awkward cultural situations that we'll throw them into um, to prepare them for those first days on ground, which they will see probably within weeks of leaving the doors of our schoolhouse since we're the last thing they see before they go to the force. 
So we are literally the finishing school for special operations forces. And we take that very seriously to prepare them in every respect that we can to go out the door and immediately be operating as a special operator in a critically important mission anywhere in the world. Um, so that's, that's kind of the future of the course we're working on right now. Um, and then hey, as for me, you know, I'm, uh, I'm approaching the end of my career, but I'm looking to, uh, stay here through the next summer and then I'll be moving on to my next assignment, probably another training assignment here. Um, that, that, that's where I've settled, um, and, and looking forward to a new challenge, whatever it may be. Okay. Well, guys, once again, this has been a look, we're trying to kind of peel that curtain back and let you guys take a look. This has been a look inside the language school. It's an absolutely fascinating uh, approach to training, to putting these troops out on the ground everywhere in the world that they go to. And I've learned so much of just not a language, but a whole cultural perspective. I had no idea about that. Guys, make sure you stay tuned. This is just one part of this episode that we're coming from Fort Bragg and talking to these special operators, talking to these special forces communicators. Stay tuned for the next one. We'll see you guys then.